That plane over there was the plane that I did my skills test in, which is like the passing moment, the apex, the zenith, learning to be a pilot. And it's a time of year, we're in spring now, where a lot of you will be thinking about learning to fly. You might be thinking what will happen, what won't happen. So in this brief video, these lucky people there going up in their PA-28, I'm gonna talk you through some of the things to expect, some of the things you should look out for, and also the feelings that you're gonna have along the journey. So here she is, Golf Foxtrot Tango. She's the one that I did it in. And there is the cockpit. That smell you get when you go inside one of these beasts. Lovely plane. And also for some reason it had ashtrays in it, which I could never figure out. You probably are wondering where my plane is. It's currently being flown somewhere else. I think it's in North Weald. So it should be parked back here pretty soon, but look at her. That's what I passed my skills test in. Pig of a thing to trim, but there you go. You're watching this video at the moment because you're thinking about learning to fly. But the first thing you need to do is just book a flying lesson and go up for an hour. And you will not believe how quickly and how instantly you'll know whether this is what is right for you or not. Even though later on in your flying learning career, there will be moments where you doubt yourself and I'll definitely cover that as well. And you'll be sat in the left-hand seat, which is the captain's seat next to an instructor. The instructor will pretty much fly all of the flight up until you're in straight and level flight at altitude, whereby they'll see if you can do some turns, see if you can pitch the nose up, pitch the nose down, and understand the feeling of flying a plane. But the reason you're there is to learn to fly, isn't it? You're not gonna know how to do it straight away. So the first thing I would say is just book that lesson, get up there and do that first hour. So you've been and done your first lesson, you've come back and it was okay. And you're happy, everything's going well. After about two or three hours, once you've booked another lesson or two and gone up, hopefully your CFI or your instructor, the guy who's instructing you or the lady who's instructing you, if they think you're serious about this, and let's face it, if you're serious about this yourself, they're going to ask you a couple of questions. And those questions are gonna be based around things that you should purchase. So the first question I was asked was, when are you gonna buy your own headset? And I was like, well, why do I need one? There's one given to me by the group. These are the slight nudges that you get from a good flight instructor. And Jeremy, if you're watching, you're a legend, I love you. Still haven't taken you up flying yet, actually, mate, after all those times. Maybe you've refused to come up with me after all those horrid lessons we had, all those bouncy landings and terrible crosswinds. They, he said to me, you've got to buy a headset because if you're serious about doing this, you need to invest some of your own money into it outside of the cost of lessons, which for me was about 170, 180 pounds an hour, which included the plane, the instructor, the fuel, everything. That was the cost of it. So you'll be asked to buy something like a headset. And you'll also be asked to buy a thing called a whiz wheel, a wind wheel, which looks like this. And that is gonna help you to navigate. It will look very, very complicated when you first get it, but there's plenty of videos out there on YouTube where you can learn how it works. So you'll be asked to buy a few things. It's really, really important. The next big thing is it usually takes most students and don't put yourself up against this. Don't think, oh, I've, fl I've flown for this amount of time. Why have I not soloed yet? Everyone is different. And it takes, took me nine hours to solo, okay? But you, there needs to be things in place for you to get to that stage. Like these lucky guys here. Bit of a sketchy takeoff there, actually. Man, don't know how lucky they are today. Very lucky. But if you divide up your training into about four or five different chunks, the first chunk is getting used to handling an aircraft. The next chunk is getting used to taking off in an aircraft and doing the takeoff. The next chunk is landing, and that's kind of the sort of segmented first bit. Once you've done that, you'll do your solo, and that is a massive part. It's called exercise 14, I believe, and you can only do it once. And there's a video of me soloing on this channel, which you can watch at the end of this, because I was lucky enough to film my solo, because I used to film all my lessons to revise from them and everything, make sure that mistakes or things that I'd missed in the cockpit, that sort of stuff. 
But to get to that stage, you need to have a certain thing sorted out and put down, and that is a certain exam. You need to pass what's called the air law exam, which is the most boring exam in flying. But it's very important because it teaches you about the legal control limits of people who control aerodromes, like air traffic controllers, FISOs, things like that you'll know about in 10 hours time if you start learning to fly tomorrow, okay? But we need to have that nailed down and in before we can go up and do our solo. So let's talk about the solo. It's one of the three major steps really in learning to fly. If you can get up and do one circuit, land the plane safely, then you've passed like a major part. It's just a huge, it's an exhilarating feeling to, to get back on the ground. And you can see in this shot here how exhilarated I was. I, I think I almost punched the combing on the plane when it happened. I was, I was so happy. So you've passed that and then you get to this sort of weird stage. This And I, I actually found for me in learning to fly, the next stage was actually the hardest because I felt like I could do it, but I started to question my ability because I was being pushed to do more by my flight instructor uh, to understand more. And also I realized that there's another eight exams I've got to do, eight written ground exams. On top of that, a radio telephony exam. So you have to sit there in a room and talk on a radio for an hour, just like this lady right now. And in the time after that, what you'll do, you'll feel like you don't, you're taking two steps forward, one step back. You'll have a worrying landing or you'll have some sort of issue. I mean, I think one of the main things people really struggle with is using the radio. What you learn over the next 20 hours of learning to fly is how to handle in cockpit jobs. So not to get overloaded. If you've ever got spare time where you're flying to do your engine checks, make sure your radio's dialed in right, things like that. Um, and you'll be, you'll start to get a feel for it and you'll know it's going right because your instructor starts to talk about the television or football or something like that. They're not so worried about your flying anymore. They just want to know that you're safe, you're competent and that you're going to be able to get from A to B safely without busting any airspace or anything like that. He's going to do some stunts here. Oh, Spitfire coming through, Spitfire. So I can't overstate how much of a privilege it is to fly at a place like this. But there are times when I've been here completely on my own, when I've come back and landed late in the middle of the summer, there is no one here. And you're almost with like the ghosts of other pilots who've flown here. Because it does, it has that, evokes that sort of feeling when you're here. Nice and quiet, all the planes sat there, all that potential in them. It's brilliant. So the next section you're going to go through is what I found with the most fun because I've always had like a love of navigating or of flying about, that sort of thing. And um, that was literally navigating, using a map, a compass, a stopwatch to navigate your way around the country and stop off at places with your instructor for, you know, cups of tea and a bacon roll. And, um, and then out of nowhere, after doing that for about 15, 20 hours or something, uh, you're suddenly told you're going to go and do your cross-country nav, which is the second huge moment where you get sent off to take off from your home aerodrome, to land at another aerodrome, take off from there, land at another aerodrome, take off from there and then come back again. All using a map, a stopwatch and your brain. You have to fly a minimum of, I think it's like 150 nautical miles. Um, it takes about three hours, three or four hours. When I landed at Norwich Aerodrome, I, I, sorry about this Norwich, but you had some very unusual spoons in there with little holes in them. And I, to this day, still fly with that spoon. Still always in my flying bag, this little spoon that I picked up. My instructor, I remember Jeremy said to me, he said, there, as an instructor, you, take, you let someone go and do a solo, that's one thing, he said. But when you come back from your cross country nav, he said, that's a real proud moment, um, you know, to watch you do that. So you've done your cross-country nav. The next thing is getting prepared for the skills test. And along this way, your instructor should say a few things to you that shows that they're good or not. One of them will be, I don't think I can teach you anymore, right? That if you get to that point, they're an honest instructor. They don't want to just take your money for the hours. They want you to do the right thing. Jeremy said that to me, and I actually caught that in a video when I think we did a skills test recap. It was like a two hour long video that I did. And at the end of it, he said, I can't teach you anymore, you're ready. You're just ready. Get your skills test booked. You've, done, you've proven that you can fly and land a plane. You, you're now 
proficient at handling it, you're happy to do that, you're happy to talk on the radio, but can you prove to another instructor, another human being, another person, that you can deal with emergency situations so they can cut the engine? Can you land in a field or get down so they know you're gonna land in a field? Because believe me, they don't actually make you land in random fields as part of your training, that doesn't happen. Can you call out dangers? Can you act as a pilot in command? So if you see another plane, can you move away from it? Can you make decisions? Because a lot of flying a plane is actually making decisions and being positive about them. And then in a way, communicating them with other people in the sky so they know what you're doing. Aviate navigate, communicate, that's what we always say. So if the radio's going and there's something going on in the cockpit, just fly the plane, all right? Don't do anything else, fly the plane, be safe. And you'll get up to this, I think for me, this was the hardest bit because there were points that I didn't understand very well. I found it very difficult to learn to track VORs and DMEs, which are special things that we use for radio navigation. I found that a real difficulty. And there'll be something that you find difficult. You will get to a point where you're like, this is really hard. I don't think I can do this. I'm just going to give up. But you're 30 hours in now. You've done two of the hurdles. You've probably passed six of your exams. You've done your radio telephony. You're almost there. So just stick with it because the day you pass is one of those days you're just never going to forget. It really isn't. When you get out of the plane and your instructor says to you, you've passed, you're now a private pilot and you can get one of these. The day you get that is one of the best days ever. Try not to talk about getting that in the pub, right? That's like one of the hardest things. So how do you find out if someone's a pilot? You don't have to, they'll tell you. <laughs> That's literally the joke. The skills test is a, is a really difficult bit. And I, like I said, I struggle with a lot of parts of it. There are a couple of times I actually almost got to doing my skills test, but I wasn't happy with things like my weights and balances. Um, and I, you know, you just have to tell people when you're not happy about something or you're struggling with something to tell them about it because they're there to help you. You're, you're actually paying them to help you. From all this distance away now, I don't really know what I was worried about. I, I didn't sleep properly in the days leading up to it. I was very nervous um, and I just wanted to be so prepared. I remember sitting in the, in the kitchen, Emily was doing like, you know, whatever in the kitchen and stuff and I was sat there doing like redoing my weights and balances, making sure my radio frequencies are okay, practicing diversions. I've done a video on diversions. Um, diversions are something, if you practice them enough, and they're the one thing you can actually practice on the ground, like with a knee board and pr pretend. So I, I did this thing when I was doing diversions, I'd look down at my knee board and do a bit, and then I'd look up and watch the TV, because watching the TV would then be flying the plane, and that would be how I'd try to separate my brain and my focus to flying the plane, then doing the diversion. And then when it happened, when I had to do a diversion in my skills test, it was natural for me to have it all run out and I could just do it. Getting to the skills test point and passing a private pilot's license, for you right now, you'll think it's insurmountable, but it isn't, it's just, small little increments of progress and divided up into sort of three or four big sections. And this was where I was told that I'd passed my private pilot's license by Barry. Cheers, Barry. It was a great time. I knew it was going well when Barry said, do you want to learn something? I'm going to show you how to survey a field at 500 feet to see if you can land in it. And I knew then, I was like, I'm going to pass here. I'm going to do all right. God, I remember the times in here, the fear that I went through, going through paperwork. Oh, that, that one thing I'll say now, when you get out of a plane, when you're, especially when you're doing the first sort of 10 hours, they get you doing the paperwork straight away. And after you've flown, try and do basic maths when you just started to fly. You'll go through a lot of that, like just mental exhaustion. I also remember after my first, first few lessons, first sort of 15 lessons, 15 hours, 20 hours, I'd get home, sit on the sofa and just fall fast asleep. So that shows how much you've got to put into it, but it's worth it in the end. So what are you gonna do with your private pilot's license now you've passed? Now, I haven't done some of the things that I really want to do with it yet. I haven't traveled abroad with it yet, but I have traveled across the country with my wife and I've cut journeys short and I've navigated about and I've had fun times. I've taken friends flying. I've taken my father flying, which I think for me was like a real moment of pride for me, taking my dad flying, because he's bloody ancient, you know, and you sort of think, well, at least I did that, you know, I got that done. And hopefully I'm gonna take him flying soon to Newcastle. But anyway, once you've passed 
Don't just keep doing circuits at home. Don't keep flying locally. Push your boundaries. Fly to places that you didn't know you could go to. Land in fields that you were slightly worried about, but do it safely. Practice like I did here. And I think the, in a way, what you've done is you've given yourself the gift of flying, but the actual gift is giving it to other people. I take people who are suffering from cancer flying as part of a charity. Try to give the gift of flying to other people. When you see kids, when you take kids flying, you see their faces and you think, are they gonna go up one day and go and do their PPL when they're older? And if they did, was I the person who sort of made them start thinking about it or that memory that they always have from when they were a child going up flying? Um, is that gonna be the thing that made them do it? So when you've passed your private pilot's license, carry on giving the gift to other people, give them the gift of flight and see where it takes you.